All right. Hello. Welcome, everybody, to Twim Sisters, This Week in Mormons, Sisters Edition. The Twim Sisters Edition. With Ariane Smith. And Tiffany Hales. Back for another month. We are barely sliding in to November. Like, we are cutting it close. Because it is, we are recording tonight on the 28th. So this is our November Mm -hmm. record. Yes. So. Just coming off of Thanksgiving. Yes. Entering into the wild month of December. Holy cow. (laughs) Well, I have to say, I love Thanksgiving week. It is like my favorite week because first of all, it's a short work week. So that is really, really nice because I always take the Friday after Thanksgiving off. And so like the Wednesday when I finish work and it's the day before Thanksgiving, I'm always like, oh, I've got four whole days. I'm going to have family and really good food. Yeah. Get my Christmas decorations up, maybe do a little bit of shopping and it did not disappoint this year. It's the best. I love Thanksgiving. It's like the peace before the storm. Yes. <laughs> it's the calm before the storm. <laughs> uh, I am anxiously waiting now that we've hit the month of December for my primary assignment for next year. I'm a primary teacher. Okay. I teach the sun memes. I have my very own four-year-old son meme who's my youngest child. So of, I adore teaching him. Of like, course. Had this been my first child, I'd be like, I don't know. <laughs> You'd be like, yeah, I don't think so. Anyway, I love it. I love the sun memes so much, but I have a gut feeling they're going to be switching things up as they oh, usually do in okay. primary. You know, typically this is pretty normal. End of mm-hmm. the year, shuffle the teachers, shuffle the kids. We've got uh-huh. to, we got to merge some classes. Our ward is not going to have a nursery. Can you believe that? You don't have any kids for nursery? We have one. We will have one child left in nursery okay. after we have two coming into some memes. Okay. We'll have one child left in nursery and he's got a January birthday. So they've gotten permission from the bishop to just bump him up because he would be the lone kid in nursery if they didn't. <laughs> so they're going to have no nursery. I can, can you believe that? believe they're not going to have it. What are they going to do when visitors come and have nursery age kids? And I go, sorry, take them to class with you. Sorry. We don't, we don't, gotta, we don't, well, we don't got to know nursery. You can play with the toys. <laughs> I don't know. Isn't okay, that wild? That is definitely I've a never sign lived that in a ward without yeah. a nursery. But yes, it's a sign that my ward is, is aging. aging. And oh, it is yeah. because our primary is shrinking. We're combining our junior yeah. and senior primary because they're so small. Yeah. And we, I already have a, I say I teach some memes. I'm actually some memes and CTR four combined yeah. and there's like four kids. <laughs> so, so anyway, our primary is shrinking. Aww. So I'm waiting to see what my assignment is. I have a feeling I'm not going to be with the little ones anymore Aww. because they asked me if I was okay not being with my son. And you're like, but my well, son. no, I really want to, fine. but okay. It's behind. I'll be happy wherever they put me as long as they don't give me the class of boys that sits behind me. Oh, gosh. <laughs> <laughs> are they little terrorists? They are wild. So wild. What age are they? Which means I'm probably going to end up with yes. them. Yes. <laughs> they are a couple of classes combined. I think they are CTR Five and CTR six combined. Do they not have any girls in there to there temper is them? Not a single girl in the class, and there are like seven of them. Oh, seven or eight of them. And oh, they're darling. Like, don't yeah. get me wrong, they are darling, but, but they're a handful. They are a lot. Every week, I like look back at those teachers, and I'm just like, wow, you got your hands full. <laughs> just wait till they're deacons. <laughs> you think you got your hands I know. full now? <laughs> I know. So. <laughs> so that could be me in a month. It could be. I'm, oh. I'm going to have to like settle into that reality. Okay. If, if so, it is. so are you kind of like, okay, <laughs> I'm expecting the worst, hoping for the best yes. sort of that, a thing. That's always my strategy. <laughs> that's it's, it's a very, it's a very good coping mechanism. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, okay. Well, I have to tell you what I did tonight. You're going to laugh your head off. So, um, uh, and this is, and I'm like, and we're not even to December and I've lost my ever fluffing mind. Oh, no. So we were going to record last night on a Sunday night and you weren't feeling well. And uh-huh. so you said, Hey, can we record on Monday? And I was like, sure, no problem. And I was like, okay, I've got presidency meeting Monday night. So I was, I was kind of mentally preparing for my day today because Monday is a day that I am physically in the office. Mm-hmm. And so like, I have to get dressed up. I have to do my hair and put makeup on. I'm not sitting at home in my leggings and sweatshirt. Uh And so 
and telecommuting. <laughs> and so I was like, okay, so I'll go into my office. I had a crock pot meal so that when I got home from work, you know, I'd have dinner ready. And then I was like, okay, I've got presidency meeting at seven. And then I've got, you know, then I'll get over to Ariane's house after that. And I was like, okay, it's, it'll be a long, long day. So go to work, get home, do a, do a turkey noodle soup because I still have turkey left over. Got to use that turkey. And my husband had requested turkey (laughs) noodle soup. So then it's a little before seven. So I leave to head over to the Relief Society president's home. And so I get there and it's a little after seven and I see one car there already and we have a new counselor. So I was like, oh, that must be, that must be her car. And so I have these two big boxes of gifts that we're going to put tags on to give to our sisters. I've got my binder, I've got paint that belongs to the Relief Society. I mean, President, I mean, I needed a wagon to get there. <laughs> so, and and I typically on presidency night, you know, just kind of walk into her house, especially if it's, uh-huh. you know, around the time. So I don't even knock on the door. I just open the door and I'm joking with her. I'm like, mom, I'm home. <laughs> oh, so her I hus- have a feeling this is going. Her husband comes around the corner. Because Tracy's like, who is that? Her husband comes around the corner and I walk into their kitchen and like she has Christmas stuff everywhere. She's uh-huh. decorating her house. And I'm like, uh, do we not have presidency meeting tonight? <laughs> She's like, no, that's tomorrow night. Oh, dear. And I was like, well, better to be early than late. <laughs> that's true. At least you didn't miss it. Did you at least get to leave all your stuff there? I did. Her <laughs> husband was like, are these boxes for presidency meeting? And I said, yes. And he's like, I'll just put them in the dining room. You can have them tomorrow night. <laughs> so we had kind of... <clears throat> A little, I would say, mini presidency meeting because we had not had time in the last few weeks to really touch base Mm -hmm. and connect. So we did that. And then I go home. And so I walk in the door and my husband is surprised to see me because he thinks he's not going to see me until after he's asleep when I Mm -hmm. get home from recording this podcast. And he's like, well, that was the shortest presidency (laughs) meeting ever because we are not known for short presidency meetings. And I said, oh, wrong night. I'll be doing that again tomorrow night. So then I helped him. And let me tell you what I helped him with. We have our ward Christmas party this Saturday night. My husband is in construction and every year for the ward Christmas party without fail, he is requested to build something. Yes. I remember last year you made a big screen. We made the big screen for the shadow theater Mm -hmm. and we've done, we did a, 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 a well a few years ago for, you know, night at Bethlehem. We did night at Bethlehem. Well, this year, I don't exactly know what they're doing. It's like they're doing Polar Express meets Jesus. I I I don't I don't really understand. It's a mashup. It's a mashup. (laughs) I don't really understand the gist of it. But the assignment is make a train. And so they sent my husband this picture of this big old train made out of cardboard and said, "Will you and the young men build this?" Because my husband's in young men, which means basically, "Will you build this?" Because inviting the young men to help is just inviting disaster. (laughs) So. Oh, good news for us. We recently upgraded our freezer. And when they came to deliver it, they wanted $90 to take it out of the box and plug it in. And I'm like, oh, no, I can do that on my own. So I hadn't unpacked it yet. So I had this big old freezer box for the basis of the train. So I helped my husband like kind of construct the train. We have to Uh paint it and everything, but at least get it kind of constructed. And um, for the Ward Christmas party on Saturday night that we are not going to be at because we have our tipple oh, shift. Oh, you're not even going to get to I'm see. I'm not even going to see. But see I need a full the- report on the Polar Express slash Jesus, Jesus mashup. Like, <laughs> who's going to tell me this now? I'll get the Relief Society president to take copious notes. Also, your ward is feeling a little extra this year. Would you like to come join our stake? Well. I feel like your ward belongs in our stake. They'd fit right in. Exactly. <laughs> I have to tell you, the the train, and granted, we just, like, we, he went and got some boxes today, and so we kind of pieced it together, and we cut out the wheels and everything. So basically, all we have to kind of do is paint it and do uh-huh. a few things like that. Seems infinitely easier than that dang screen that we had to build <laughs> last year. Like, that thing was enormous. And then I had somebody this year who was like, oh, so-and-so wants to borrow that. Do you have that? And I was like, are you kidding me? You think I kept that? No. <laughs> You should be renting this out. You could have a side gig. I am not about that kind of storage in my life. (laughs) Anyway, so yes, that was my evening. So I get to return to the Relief Society President's House tomorrow night, and we're going to try presidency meeting round two. Well, good luck with that. (laughs) 
We're not even to December. And the train. We want pictures. <gasps> you need to post a picture of the train on I our Instagram account. I will post a picture of the train on the Instagram account. And I will do that. Somebody needs to report on this yeah. situation. With maybe the Polar maybe Express. when we return in December uh, <laughs> for our December podcast, I, I can have an update on how the Polar Express met Jesus. Yes. Because I drive to the manger. <laughs> I'm assuming really, that's what's happening. I have, I, I honestly have no idea. I, you know, when I, my husband showed me the picture. So we're lying in bed. Like he wakes up at like three in the morning one night. And for some reason he wakes me up and, and he says, oh, by the way, I have to build a train. And I'm like, what are you talking about? And he's like, yeah, so-and-so who's in charge of the Gord Christmas party sent me this and I agreed to build a train. And I'm like, hand me your phone. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm looking at it. I'm like, just kind of rolling my mm. eyes going, are you kidding? And so I snapshotted the picture and, and, and sent it to myself and I, and I kind of Googled it. There is some program out there oh. that they found on the internet that they this is a thing going around. This is a thing going, going around. around. So maybe probably I'll, started in Utah. Maybe I ought to save the trade <laughs> this time, <laughs> except again, I'm not about that kind of garage space. <laughs> I, I need like, I, if, in theory, I would love someday to park my vehicle in my garage. <laughs> oh, man. Okay. Anyway. All right. But I will post a picture of the train to our twin sister's yes. Instagram. Yes. Actually, I'll send it to you and ask you to post it. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. All right. So we get to some news. Well, we ought to do some news. That's what we're here for. All right. So this first story we're going to start with just came out today. Um, this was about the ecclesiastical clearance office of the Ooh. church schools. So this came out today in the Tribune. It was a report on some of the recent kind of fallout of that. Yes. Um, I I don't know, sometime in the last year. We did a story yeah, on this. They did a story. BYU was tightening yes. their, their – it wasn't just do you have an ecclesiastical endorsement by right. your bishop – like you, if they thought you were off track in any way, shape, or form, they right. could, and they were expanding it to all employees, yes. not just not just because it used to be just like professors. Yes. Um, but there, this is like everybody, even the custodians now yes. have to go through this ecclesiastical clearance, clearance. and they created a special office for it um, just a couple years ago in 2020. It's called the Ecclesiastical Clearance Office. Well, contracts are coming up for the new year, and um, there have been a handful of people who've been let go from the BYUs. And so this uh, article in the Tribune, they had interviewed a couple of uh, faculty members now, that did were let go. Did Fletcher Stack write this one, or is this another reporter? Oh, you know, I didn't write down uh. who wrote this one. I think it was Peggy Fletcher okay. Stack, but I'm, I'm not 100%. Anyway, so... Um, they interviewed two people that had recently been let go, both from B uh, BYU Idaho. The first was Lindsay Larson Call. Um, she had been at her job ten years. Um, she was an online instructor. She lives in California. And then the second was a guy named Ben Buswell. He lives in Houston. Again, was an online mm -hmm. instructor. He taught business and entrepreneurship um, for BYUI. So both of them recently got let go. Um, really had no <laughs> idea other than they were told yeah. it's an ecclesiastical issue. Like, yeah, they get, they get this random call out of the blue saying, right. yeah, we're not renewing your contract. It's an ecclesiastical issue. And their supervisors had like no idea. Yeah. Like the, no. their colleagues at the school supervisors, everybody's completely clueless. Like has And no, nobody will tell them why. No idea. Nobody will give them like a specific reason why. Both um, of them were endorsed by their bishops. Yes. They, the, and so one of them went back to their bishop. Well, let me just read you the okay. the requirements. I thought this was really interesting. This is a quote um, from the official ecclesiastical clearance office. Says that their purpose is to assess historical and current activity in the Church of Jesus Christ, religious behavior, and support for the teachings, practices, and leadership of the Church of Jesus Christ. In addition to verifying whether an employee or applicant holds a temple recommend. So it's very expansive. I mean, it's not just, I mean, they're, they're talking about religious behavior, support for the teachings. I mean, that could be, I guess it's very subjective. That's yes. What I think. So, yes. so the one guy, um, Ben Buswell, he went back to his bishop and he's like, you know, I'm just trying to figure out, can you think of anything that would have, because his bishop is like, no, I gave you an endorsement. Like I, I didn't say his bishop 
did not go back and say, this Mm -hmm. guy is not worthy. He said there was a form he had to fill out. um, And the only thing that the bishop could think of was um, on one of the parts of the form, uh, he said um, that casually he had recently had a conversation with his bishop about LGBTQ issues and Mm -hmm. some of his personal concerns about those issues. So that was kind of fresh in the Bishop's mind. And so he had said um, somewhere on the form that he had expressed some concerns, Mm -hmm. or I don't know if this is on a phone call or in the form. Somehow this Bishop had said he expressed some concerns, but like not a big deal. Yeah. The Bishop wasn't concerned about it. No, Bishop wasn't concerned about it. So that is like the only thing that he can think of that it would be. But again, they don't know for sure because like nobody will, it's all very private and kind of the same um, with this, with the woman, Lindsay Larson called. She um, also like had no clue, couldn't figure it out. She tried to call like HR and get Uh some answers and it was just very much like, Oh, we can't tell you. It's just an ecclesiastical issue. That's all we know. So she did admit though. And it sounds like she maybe has been a little bit more Mm -hmm. open in her doubts um, because she did say that throughout her life, she has wrestled with questions on her Mm -hmm. belief, but she remained committed to the faith. And and she kind of saw that um, her role teaching at a church school was to show that, you know, you can be committed to the faith and, also have like questions and Mm -hmm. and not feel like you know the answers to everything. And so I don't know how much of that was coming out in her teaching or not, but her colleagues and, and uh, supervisors were all shocked. Like they had not seen anything concerning. Um, But she did say that she also like raised some concerns, but she said it was five or six years ago over some LGBTQ issues. She was in the social sciences Mm -hmm. and during a training, they were, showing a video. Um, they were having a meeting and talking about LGBTQ issues. And she pushed back against some video that they had showed that theorized that mothers contributed to same sex attraction in their children. So she gave a little pushback to that, but she said that was like five or six years ago. Well, and her pushback was that's not consistent with what the church official website and policy says. Her pushback was totally legit. You know, she's like, shouldn't we be consistent? Yes. (laughs) Anyway, so then, um, yeah, it's just, they've said that, you know, there have also been some colleagues that have quit because they're not feeling super safe in their jobs. They did come back to Lindsay about a month after she got let go, um, she talked to somebody at the office of the ECO mm. office, and they told her that she could resubmit um, a request to have her case looked at with mm-hmm. fresh eyes. She couldn't guarantee anything would change, but she could do that. But Lindsay said that she declined at that point because she just felt like, what's the point yeah. if I'm always going to be worried about my yeah. job? So I don't know. This is very interesting perspective. Um, I think the initial thought from a lot of people when they read a headline like this online is like, well, you signed up to teach at BYU. What do you expect? You have to live the standards, which agreed, agreed. Yeah. But I just think the danger that you run is something like this can be so subjective. Exactly. And, you know, you can have a bishop that if you do have concerns about LGBTQ stuff, just blow is like mm-hmm. okay no big deal like that yeah. that doesn't affect your membership or you're you know you're not teaching anything yeah. you're not this isn't coming up in class you're not teaching this to the kids or you can have a bishop that goes the opposite route that is like oh gosh they are really struggling this is something yeah. that needs to be addressed so it's yeah. just it's going to end up all over the place and well and it's just i mean to me it's troubling on a on a, on a number of fronts i mean first of all we only have their position about what they've been able to find out. Right. So we don't know if there's there a is, whole other side of the story. There's that we a don't whole know. other side of the story that we don't know. But, and, and the troubling aspect to that is, you know, in is, is that they don't know. Right. And they're, and it's not being communicated to them and the kind of the lack of transparency, because that's what breeds, in my opinion, the fear and, okay, you know, if, you know, other professors out there or other employees going, gosh, am I going to lose my job because 
you know, I happen to be Facebook friends with somebody, you know, who is LGBTQ, you know, you, you don't know where the line is because again, it is so subjective. And so, you know, at least if they could have some answers in terms of, you know, this is what we saw and this is what we were concerned about. And this is why we're letting you go because the bottom line is, you know, this is, there's no con- continuing contractual employment relationship. So, you know, legally they can't turn around and, you know, sue the church for letting them go because, um, you know, an employer can, can let you go for any reason, right? essentially. Um, you know, I mean, certainly there are reasons that if they are discriminating based on protected classes, but, um, you know, within the church, um, you know, it, it, you know, it is expected that you will follow the same beliefs of the church if you're going to be an employee of the church. So it's just, I don't know, it's just so not black and white to me. There are so many different layers here. Yeah, it's really and messy. And I just, it's messy. I wish mm-hmm. there were more transparency so that everybody could kind of have an understanding of what the expectation is. Yeah. Other than, well, just like you said, I find this to be offensive where my neighbor may not find behavior or things that were said to be concerning enough. Right. So, yeah, Yeah, it's, it's interesting. (laughs) It's going to get messy. I I really hope that, I don't know. I just hope they can find a way to figure it all out. Exactly. There's got to be a a better way. I don't know. Well, and yeah, I mean, who knows? And maybe a couple of stories like this Mm -hmm. where they're getting a lot of pushback in the media because you read the social media comments on this and the social media comments on this are just kind of all over the board. You know, the church is awful or, you know, what do you expect? You know, you should know better sort of a thing. And so, you know, sometimes, sometimes movement happens that way. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. And that brings us to my next story, which I have been ruminating on for a couple of weeks now. (laughs) I had initially seen this in the Deseret News and read it. And then the very next day, one of our aunts emailed it to me and she said, oh, I thought you might like to find this story interesting. So it is entitled Latter-day Saints in the Media Need Better Representation. And it is so fascinating. It's written, it was a Deseret News article. It was written by this individual named Rebby Brassfield. And she starts off the story by going back to 2001 when she's watching Ocean's Eleven in the theater and they make some passing reference to LDS people. Mm-hmm. And she's like, oh, wow, I've arrived, you know. Yes. There's representation I feel like me. I, as she was describing this moment, I was like, we've all felt that, right? Exactly. When, when you're sitting in there and they make a joke about LD. you're like That's us. exactly <laughs> exactly us. because we all want to feel <laughs> included mm-hmm. and so after that happened she and her friends started kind of collecting they started this instagram called at mormons in the media and i was going to look it up today and i, totally I know i want to check it out and forgot it yeah. anyway so it started as a joke between her and her writing partner and anytime they would see any sort of reference in any sort of tv show or movie or anything like that to a member of the church um, that I th- that would go on their Instagram account. And so they found like everything, you know, Friends, Frasier, Cheers, Gossip Girl, 30 Rock, Curb Your Enthusiasm, Stranger Things, Gilmore Girls, mm-hmm. all of these shows that in certain episodes had references to members of the church. And she noted that nearly every reference was a casual joke about the cultural aspects of our faith that make its members feel unrelatable. And so after kind of studying this, she thought, well, I don't really feel represented. I feel like a caricature. And then she wasn't feeling very good about it. So she created this rubric. I love me a good rubric. (laughs) She created an ABC rubric. So we're going to start with C. And C grade is punchlines that play on Latter-day Saint stereotypes A B grade is stories that represent Latter-day Saints well, and an A grade is well-told Latter-day Saint stories from Latter-day Saint voices. And I have just been thinking about this all day, especially with regards to some of the stories that we're covering tonight and a lot of the stories that we have covered in the past. Mm -hmm. She's not wrong. Everything fits into one One of of these three classes. That's so true. So she said up until recently, almost every reference that she came across fell into the C category. Mm -hmm. So it was a punchline that played on on LDS um, 
Latter-day Saint stereotypes. And so she goes through a couple of those. And then she talks about the Bs. And one of her example for a B grade is, um, I watched the first season of Stranger Things, but I haven't watched it since Mm -hmm. then. Apparently in season three, one of the characters has a girlfriend who is a member of the church. And that character also continued on into season four and she was more developed in season four and they got to see her family and the complexity of her family. And she just became not a punchline, but more kind of a real, you know, this is, you know, this is how there's more to her. There's more to her. Yeah, for sure. Cause I watched both seasons and I was so, I also was like so happy with what they did with her this season. Yes. She just had a tiny little part last season and you're, it was a okay. joke. But yeah, this season, she was like one of them. Exactly. The characters. And then there's this HBO show called Tokyo Vice. Have you ever heard of no, that? No, I had not heard about that until I read this article. I'm intrigued. So it, it follows the story of Jake Adelstein. He's an American writer for a Japanese newspaper. And um, one of his few expat friends is a woman named Samantha. She is a smart, self-assured hostess with dreams of starting her own club, if only she can outrun her past. And then it says, midway through the season, we find out what that past entails, a Latter-day Saint mission, and subsequent crimes against her faith. So it sounds like maybe she was formerly Mormon in the story, but is not now Mormon. And so having never watched this, I mean, I kind of get the impression that maybe kind of they're addressing maybe what some of her faith crisis issues were in this story and kind of telling that from a real perspective instead of being a punchline. Right. And then she gets to the A's and here's who she talks about in the A's. First of all, she talks about Jeanette McCurdy and she started in iCarly and she wrote a new memoir called I'm glad my mom is, I'm glad my mom died. And this memoir focuses on really the abusive relationship that she had with her mother. And she grew up Mormon. They were very active and she was very active at the time she got this part in iCarly. You know, she's no longer attending church, but she in the memoir, it says, you know, she she doesn't really carry any bitterness towards it. Um, she kind of treats it the same as she does everything else in her book saying, you know, hey, this is kind of what happened to me. Um, and so she is expressing it, you know, from her viewpoint. I've heard a lot of buzz about this book. I have too. I'm kind of intrigued. I kind of want to read it. I've watched a couple of interviews Mm -hmm. with her. One before she wrote the book, um, you know, it was really fascinating to just kind of hear Mm -hmm. about, you know, how, I mean, she became the source of, you know, main income for her family. Like your typical child star Your very typical child star star story. So maybe we'll have to think about reading that, talking about it. I don't know. Anyway, if I can find any time to read, I can't even show up at the right night for presidency <laughs> meeting. So then she also talks another about another positive, and she talks about Manti Teo and his documentary of the girlfriend who didn't exist. And I watched that, and I'm pretty sure I've talked about that on the yeah, podcast. I think we talked it about it. It was so good. It was really good. It was very humanizing for Manti. It was actually really humanizing for the for the person who catfished him too. And um, I love that she pointed out that the people in her category, what she considers an A, uh are not perfect. No. Like she pointed out, she wants to see regular flawed people in that category. We don't don't need to be represented by perfect, active, have all the answers people. Like she just wants to see real people represented, which I think represents where where most of us are. Exactly. I mean, none of us are perfect, but... It's, it's so true. And Mm -hmm. I think so often I was just actually having this conversation with a friend yesterday. Mm -hmm. So often we sit at church and we look at all of the families in church. And unless you're in a leadership position, you have no idea what's going on in those families. You know, what's going on in your family. And you're like, my family is a hot mess. (laughs) And you look at all these other families and you're like, their family's perfect. Their family's perfect. Their Uh family's perfect. Everybody's perfect. But me, we're a hot mess. Because you don't know what's going on with those other families because it's kind of so ingrained that we want right. to put on this air of, oh, everything's fine, blah, 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 blah. And, and, and it's interesting because if you can get past the, oh, how are you doing? Oh, I'm fine. Oh, how are you mm-hmm. doing? Oh, I'm fine. And sit down and really have a meaty conversation with somebody, you will discover in all likelihood 
that they are facing challenges, if not similar to yours, at least Mm -hmm. similar in pain and hardship that they cause. Right. And so I really like that idea of, I wish we could maybe be a little more honest in telling those stories. Totally. And I think that, I think part of the problem in the past is, I think we overcorrect. I think we're used to being the butt of a joke Mm -hmm. and we're used to being portrayed negatively in the media and in pop culture. So I think that we think in our hearts, we just want to see a good Mormon person. (laughs) Exactly. But if we're being really honest, this is what a good LDS, like, yeah, this is, yeah, this is just people like us who are trying to live, you know, their best and, and some are in the church and maybe some have had struggles and are out, but those are all things that are, I think are really important for us to see not only the rest, people who aren't members to see. So they realize that there's like lots of varying like levels and degree. There's a lot to us. There's a lot of layers, but I think it's also really important for us to see too, like to recognize that like, oh yeah, not everybody's perfect and that's okay. We don't have to put up this front. We don't have to like, we don't have to come off as perfect to the world. Exactly. We can be normal people. Well, and how often (laughs) have you heard somebody who's left the church and people Mm -hmm. leave the church for a myriad of reasons. But one of the things they will say is, oh, I'm so glad I don't have to be perfect anymore. I'm so glad I don't have to maintain this air of perfection or pretend to be perfect or feel like I'm not measuring up because I'm not perfect. I've heard that so mm-hmm. often. And, you know, and I don't, I, I, I struggle with, you know, what is it going to take for us to get beyond that feeling that we have to be perfect and we can only show the side of us that mm-hmm. is perfect and we can't show the side that is messy and complicated and ugly because we are all of that. Yeah. We are layers of things that are very good and we are layers of things that are very messy. Mm-hmm. <laughs> That's for sure. So, <laughs> so anyway, I loved this article. I thought it was very thought provoking. It will make me look at any other media that I see with it that is referencing members of the church in a completely different light. You're going to give it a grade. I'm going to give it a grade. In <laughs> fact, I'm probably going to give some a grade tonight as we Ooh, go through. Yippee. So, <laughs> okay. So next article, this was a Peggy Fletcher stack. From the Tribune, I think it was last week, um, or few, actually just a few days ago, and she was talking about um, there was a talk given last month to Latter Day Saint chaplains by um, a Matt. Um, I'm going to butcher his name, Ahmad Corbett, who okay. is the first counselor in the church's general young men's presidency. And the whole talk was about activism versus discipleship. And he came down like pre- with some pretty strong words um, about, um, he said, when ag- activism or advocacy is directed at the kingdom of God on earth or its leaders, especially prophets and apostles, it is the wrong tool for the wrong job in the wrong place. Um, and he talks about how Satan uses this as a tool mm-hmm. um, against the church. So Peggy Fletcher Stack um, just kind of dived into this theory that, you know, in his talk, and she interviewed some people in the church who many consider active activists. activists. Oh, <laughs> no, I have not read this article. So I am, um, I am anxiously. It was a very interesting take. Uh-huh. Um, you know, she pointed out that like, our church has been constantly changing and she pointed out some of the things that have changed shifted, but she said ba- some are big shifts and some are mm-hmm. little tiny, small shifts, you know, over years that you yeah. don't notice unless you look back, um, abandoning polygamy, the priesthood and temple prohibition that black members faced, uh, the controversial LGBTQ mm-hmm. policy, um, allowing women to serve as witnesses in temples. These are all things that have you yeah. know, shifted and evolved over the years. And she just kind of points out that like, maybe activism might have had a little bit of a role in that. <laughs> but also there are different degrees of activism, right? Yeah. And um, so she interviewed some people. She interviewed um, Darius Gray, okay. who's a very famous um, black member of the church who was one of the original that started the Genesis group Okay, that was started back in the 60s. Um And so he talks about, you know, that period of time where 
they did get permission to band together Uh as, you know, black members of the church, um, at that time and just about how, you know, the right person had to be in charge, which was Mm -hmm. president Kimball and enough people had to ask questions. Enough leaders had to ask questions and start praying about this and that, you know, yeah, yeah, there's a little bit of activism in that. (laughs) So it's not protesting on Temple square, but you got to sometimes ask some questions. Exactly. And, and, you know, I think back a few years ago when Kate Kelly was on her campaign of mm-hmm. give women the priesthood, um, you know, I mean, well, they mentioned her too. They, oh, they mentioned Kate Kelly. What and, do they say about Kate well, Kelly? Well, they just say, you know, that was a very dramatic movement. It was. Um, but they said, if we're, you know, if we're being honest, have there been some results from that? In a post Kate Kelly Mm -hmm. world, women can be witnesses. Exactly. I mean, they would never credit Kate Kelly with that. (laughs) Oh, no, 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 no. But, well, and I also think about the women praying in conference. Yeah. Because that kind of came around about that same time. Did you know women used to not even be able to pray in church? Oh, in Sacramento meeting? Yeah, I learned this recently. Uh Like, that didn't change until 60s, maybe? But yeah, they used to not yeah. even be able to pray in sacrament yeah. meeting. And and then, you know, it just takes a little push sometimes. It takes exactly. a little nudge. It's it's not that Well, and and it's a fine line because yeah. you look at a lot of the revelations that came from the Doctrine and Covenants and they came from Joseph asking questions. Mm-hmm. Some things were questions that he had, some things were questions that people had uh had had put in his mind or given to him that he was pondering. And so, right. you know, when they say that, you know, to, to start asking questions, you know, it, that, that is very true how revelation comes because mm-hmm. the Lord isn't going to, you know, knock on the door and go here, I'm here with some new revelation. We have to be ready to receive it. Right. And we have to be ready to receive it by having open enough minds, whether it's personal revelation, whether it's revelation for the church, it's the same either way. The Lord isn't going to tell us until A, we're ready, and right. B, we ask. Right. So, and sometimes to know to ask, you have to make some, someone has to make you aware that exactly. there's a situation you might not even be aware of. Exactly. <laughs> so they interviewed um, a Mormon studies uh, professor at the U- University of Utah, and he said the church is both, both hierarchical and democratic at once. And he kind of talked about this like constant tension between the two um, because uh-huh. we are a church of like continuing revelation um, and that many historically many changes did come from members yeah. with, with no leadership position. Like he talked about how children's primary was created like early on in our church. Yeah. Now, now we're very, you know, central, nothing. It's correlated. It's not like, yes, correlated. But early on in the church, like things were started. Oh, it was the wild west. Like, primary was started <laughs> yeah. because some members like had an idea and they did it. And so he t- just talks about how historically our church, there's always a balance, right? Yeah. Between this, like, you know, the hierarchy of it and the people who exactly make it up. So anyway, it was a very it's interesting article to food read. Food for thought. Yes, it is. It's chewy. Something to think about. It's something to chew yeah. on. All right. Well, let's hit a couple more stories here. We have a taste of Thanksgiving at the Provo MTC. Uh, the church news did an article on how 1,050 missionaries spent the holiday. I will just hit the highlights. Currently the MTC has 1,050 missionaries. They started out the day by getting a, um, devotional from Quentin L. Cook and his wife. And after that, then they divided into two groups and one group got to go watch Ephraim's rescue. The other group went and did this service project and then they flipped after a couple of hours. And so this service project was called um, Hunger Fight and they put together 400,000 meal kits um, that are destined for the Utah Food Bank. And so apparently this is not their first year doing it. They had done it in um, 2021 and they put together 380,000 kits in about four hours. And so that is obviously a lot to be able to feed people in Utah. And one of the one of the uh, people from Fight Hunger Fight said, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is one of the greatest organizations we've worked with. Uh, said that they run the place better than the Marine Corps and that no one is curt or rude and the love of the Lord is apparent. So I thought that was very cool. They did some service on Thanksgiving. 
And then after that, they finished the evening with a concert from John Schmidt of the Piano Guys doing Ooh. Christmas carols. And then they were able to um, walk the MTC campus, see the Christmas lights, and sing Christmas carols. So, And some of these missionaries who are not American, this was their first exposure to oh, right. Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving in America. <laughs> and so they, you know, they had no idea what this would be like. And even missionaries who were away from home for Thanksgiving for the first time said, it was great. So I'm going to give this story an A grade on the rubric because this is Mormons <laughs> telling their, I'll say members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, telling their own story. Very good. Okay. <laughs> Very good. Okay. Next article is about the giving machines. The gi- giving <gasps> machines have returned. The giving machines. Um, they've added some more this year. Um, they are working with nearly 125 local and global nonprofits. Um, through these giving machines that they're Which coordinating I with. I didn't realize they were working with local nonprofits. I thought yeah. this was all stuff, you know, you buy a goat, it goes overseas. Right, yeah. I didn't realize some of it was staying locally. Yeah. Anyway, very cool. Also this year, this is new. There will be two giving machines that will be traveling giving machines. The traveling machine. I thought this is a great idea. Spread the love, right? Yes. So one of them is going to travel around Arizona. In fact, I will be in Arizona. <gasps> When it's there in Tucson after Christmas, I might just okay. have to check it out. You might have to go check it out because I've never seen these machines in person. I, I never have to. either. <laughs> so, and the other, where's the other one going to be? The other one is going to be traveling in the southeast. It's going to hit like Alabama, Birmingham, South Carolina, I think North Carolina too. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, there's a whole list of dates and locations. So they will be out and about. They're all over now and internationally and all over the country. So yes, and then they got a little bit of hype. From some famous people in Kansas City. There, yes. There's a machine in Kansas City. I don't know if this is a new one. Is this one of the new ones? Mm, I, I don't know. It's at what's called the Crown one. Center, which I think is like, because Kansas City is the is Hallmark. That's Hallmark's like world headquarters. Oh, I didn't know that. And so I think the Crown Center, correct me if I'm wrong, Kansas City people, I think it's like a mall there. Oh, okay. So they got to have a machine in the Christmas movie capital of the well, country. Yeah. Right? <laughs> so anyway, they've got some big endorsements. Paul Rudd, Eric Stone Street have been hyping the uh-huh. machines. They are both Kansas City natives. As well as Andy Reid, the yes. chief, the football coach for the, the Kansas City coach. Chief. He like did a video with his family yes. going to the giving machine. Yes. So they're all they're all hyping the giving machine. Okay. So all right. Well, now let's move on to a story that really gets under my skin. <sighs> Oh, so these the <laughs> this last it. weekend BYU played Stanford, and the Stanford band staged a controversial halftime skit during the football game. So what the band did is they brought out two women and had they called they called this the gay chicken is what their stunt was. They brought out these two women. They engaged in a mock wedding ceremony using some language from the temple ceremony. There, if you are a member of the church, that is exceptionally offensive. BYU is not having a good time at these away no, games this year because we talked about Oregon. Yeah, that was just like last yeah. time we podcasted, wasn't exactly. it? Or maybe two times ago when exactly. the Oregon crowd was like shouting. <laughs> exactly. So there's been a little pushback. There was an article in the Daily Universe. It said um, fans were confused why Stanford administration would allow such a production at halftime because Stanford actually has a number of members on their football team, right. several of whom are returned full-time missionaries. They've got a highly touted starting quarterback, Tanner McKee, and um, the skit also comes less than three weeks following a statement issued by Stanford in response to a series of intolerant messages written uh, in relation to a religious uh, Mexican holiday mm-hmm. that had been happening on campus. And Stanford had said when there were some intolerant messages um, towards this um religious holiday, this Mexican religious holiday, that any form of religious bias that shows intolerance to certain rituals and practices of others is unacceptable. They make that statement on November 8th, and then their band is mocking temple rituals three weeks later. That's not great. So have they like given a statement or an apology or anything? No, no statement. Because University of Oregon was like so fast to jump in and be like, we are so sorry. Yeah. No, I Googled Uh this before we came on the show Uh tonight to record nothing. 
radio silence. In fact, the Daily Universe reached out to Stanford for a comment and nothing. You know, and I contrast this to let's look at the uh, the volleyball player who alleged that racial slurs were being made against her. And immediately, you know, there was a full on investigation and then it was, you know, determined that, you know, they're, they couldn't find any validity to the story. But I mean, had this been, had this been um, BYU making fun of LGBTQ issues, every national media organization everywhere would have picked it up. And the, the school and the church would have been slammed. Mm -hmm. And so that's what really gets under my skin more than anything else is why do you get to make fun of my religion? And why are, why, why am, you know, why do you get to show bigotry towards things that I find to be sacred Mm -hmm. and have absolutely no repercussions? Right. And it's, it's just, it's just wrong on so many regards. And I thought, think if we're going to call BYU out for sometimes it's bad behavior, yeah. then you know what? Other people need to be called out as well. And, and I give Stanford, they get a C, they get a C <laughs> in the media category <laughs> because they are trying to do cheap jokes that make fun of Mormons. That so does, C to Stanford. That does fall into the cheap joke okay. category. <laughs> get off my soapbox now. That's it's just un- really hacked me that's off. unfortunate. It is very also, unfortunate. Also, who's doing skits? What, yeah. what band is doing skits at halftime? Have you ever seen a skit yeah. at a football game? Well, and here's the other thing too. I guess in 2014 or 2004, during a visit to Stanford, the Cardinal band poked fun at the church's history of polygamy during their halftime show. So this is not apparently a new thing for them to do. So their band does like They're, full-blown skits. Apparently they do skits thing? and they like to mock the Mormons. <laughs> I wonder what Wait, they- uh, Yeah. And again, Stanford, radio silent. Come on, Stanford. At least step up to the plate and say, yeah, shouldn't have been done. Not appropriate. Yeah. That's a bummer. Anyway. Okay. Okay. I'll try and take my blood pressure down a little bit. <laughs> All right. Next article we have is reseeding the Hill Camorra. So this says nearly a hundred years ago, missionaries planted saplings on the Hill Camorra, and now they are back at it again. Um, if you will recall, the uh, Camorra, Hill Camorra pageant is no more. So they are trying to restore the Hill Camorra to what it was, you know, a couple hundred years ago. So, which is going to take, they said, you know, 20 yeah. to 25 well, years. Apparently they had, so. when William uh, Willard Bean, who, mm-hmm. you know, the church, if you've watched the movie, The Fighting Preacher, the church sent him out there to, you know, get the land for the Hill Camorra. And missionaries at that time, once the land was required, planted all these seedlings and trees grew. Right. Then they cut a whole bunch of them down for the pageant. <laughs> right. So they're trying so, to redo their damage. Yes. So they've torn down a bunch of buildings. I did not realize how many buildings. They, they, had, they had two dozen buildings there for, for the, the pageant? pageant. I know. I went to that pageant. It was like a really long time ago. I don't remember buildings. I do remember massive parking lot. And it also said they have yeah, torn they ripped up out the parking lot. hundreds and hundreds of feet of parking lot mm-hmm. and paved paths. Um, that they're tearing up to just return it to its natural state. So, exactly. Anyway, that is the latest from Hill Camorra, but they said it'll take 25 to 35 years for it to become what they want it to be. Okay. You know, they got to wait for all those trees to grow up. Exactly. They have to tear down the stage. They said the stage is still there and that the stage has how many levels? Like three, like four layers. Three or four levels. Yeah, the it's stage. crazy. So that will be something to keep an eye on. It's going to, it's, it is interesting. Like it's going to look so different. It will It'll look very yeah. different. Okay. Next story. Christmas this year falls on a Sunday. So Woo-hoo. I really like it when Christmas <laughs> falls on a Sunday. I like to be I able to too. go to church and, and have a message about the savior and sing Christmas. I hymns. do too. As long as I don't have 9am church, I'm fine. I love it on a Sunday. Exactly. I have noon church, so I'm good. Well, but you think you're good, but you don't know oh, because, bump it, huh? because um, <laughs> the, the church news, the church released a statement saying that um, on Christmas, we will only have sacrament meeting. We will not have any other meetings. We will not have, they, they're, they like even said like no leadership meetings, no councils, no nothing. They better not. Exactly. So we're only going to have sacrament meeting and that um, bishops and branch presidents can adjust the meeting times to best accommodate their local needs. All right. So, so I don't, we may get adjusted, but there was nothing, 
New Year, New Year's we got a full Oh yeah, New Year's is a full we, slate. We got a full block. They did say that if you're if you're if it's a church sponsored dance, you're going to quit at midnight can, and go home. Can we just do one hour church on, <laughs> on New Year's too? <laughs> oh no, no. New Year's is a full slate of church. So, <laughs> dang it. <laughs> one hour church just feels like such a like I I feel like I'm a little kid again when it's like a one hour <laughs> church. It only ever happens like I could probably count on one hand oh, in I my know. lifetime when I've had it. I know. It's only ever if there's like Christmas. Yeah. I guess that's it. Well, did, sometimes church gets canceled for snow, but you don't have one hour church no. for snow. <laughs> so. It seems like during the pandemic when we were only coming for sacrament that maybe we only did one hour church. Oh, right. A yeah, couple times. True. I don't know. That's true. Oh, my stake had one hour church once when we were doing a big production in our stake center and we had to move to a different church. Oh, and that was just this that's year. That's right. But that's my stake. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, we're getting, we're getting short on time. Should we should we skip ahead real quick here yes. to, um, I've got two things tonight. Oh. I've got Mormons behaving badly. And then because my Mormons behaving badly is so awful, I have to counterbalance this with a marvelous member. Yeah, we do. So last week, Kurt briefly touched on the Colorado shooter and the shooting spree that had happened. It had only happened like less than 24 hours before Kurt recorded, I think. And so there wasn't a whole lot of information yet. There were some rumblings that maybe there were some ties to. Yes, we knew there were vague Mormon The ties. LDS church. So this week, the church released a statement, um, first of all, condemning the violent acts uh, that are a result of intolerance against any of God's children. So they spoke out very uh, very boldly and strongly, no violence. And they also said the shooter, who was a gentleman named Anderson Lee Aldrich, um, they said that they can confirm that he is listed on the rolls of the church, but he's not been involved with church service for some time, a decade or more. So he is technically a member of the church, but not an active member of the church. But this story gets better. It's never a good look. No. And so anyway, they, they, he actually, the shooting suspect actually changed his name several years ago because he didn't want to be associated with his father. And when he changed his name, his father was told that, that, that he had died, which he hadn't. But in any event, uh, somebody found tracked dad down and put a camera and a microphone in front of dad. And so dad is apparently an MM MMA fighter turned porn actor. Yes. And his name is Aaron Franklin Brink. And he's also done time in jail for meth. So his first reaction when he finds out when they shove the camera in front of his face and finds out about the shooting and that it happened at a gay bar, his first reaction, and I cannot say the words that he said because it would be highly inappropriate, is his first reaction is, is he gay? Is he gay? Oh, good. He's not gay. Woo. I'm, so, I'm so relieved. And then he goes on to say, because he apparently identifies himself as Mormon, you know, Mormons don't do gay. There are no gays in the Mormon church. We don't do gay is what Ugh. the dad says to CBS and national television. That is awful. Anyway, and there's a whole article that we will link to that g gives you more nefarious behavior of the father, which probably not that I am justifying the son's actions in any way, shape or form, but Holy cow. Um, yeah. It's um, very clear that he had like a crazy childhood. He had a crazy, crazy childhood. So that is our Mormon behaving badly for the week. Um, and I don't know which is worse, the father or the shooter, because they're both equally horrific. It's awful. So they're, it's just awful. So let's redeem ourselves with marvelous members. Okay. Good <laughs> so, idea. <laughs> so we will not lose all faith in humanity. So there is an article that came out in the church news this week about a service missionary. And you know that the church has, you've got proselyting missionaries, and now you have people who can become service missionaries. There is a young woman, and her name is Taylor Talbot. 
And Taylor, Taylor Talbot grew up and her family still resides in Ontario, Oregon, which is just across the Idaho, oh, Oregon I border. That. I didn't read that part of it. Yes. Oh. And so um, she is legally blind. She lost most of her eyesight when she was two or three in her, she's completely blind, blind in her right eye. And the vision in her left eye is comparable to looking through a drinking straw. So she can read some large print, but she mostly relies on audiobooks and things like that. Girl likes to run. That is like her thing. And I guess her parents were track athletes and that's how they met. And so that's, she comes by this naturally. And so as she got older, she decided, Hey, I want to be a Paralympian. And so she had her sights set on 2020. And then she was like, I'm going to do that, go to the Paralympics, and then I'm going to go on a mission. And then COVID happened and the Paralympics got moved to 2021. So she did qualify. She did go to Tokyo. She came back from Tokyo. She was trying to decide, am I going to go on a mission? Am I not? And she got a call that said, hey, will you come to California and train and live in the Paralympic training place here? And so she jumped on that. And she discovered that as soon as she went down there, she just had missionary opportunities everywhere. People were asking her. People were, she was giving away Book of Mormons. And she just really felt like, wow, I'm getting to train and I'm serving a mission. And um, she, uh, President Nelson had given a talk that kind of it inspired her to write to him and say, thank you for that talk. I feel like, you know, I'm serving this mission right now doing what I'm doing. He got a hold of her stake president. They gave her a special assignment as a service missionary. So she's down in California. She is um, training to be this Paralympic athlete. And she's also going around and speaking at church sponsored events, using her musical talents, doing temple work, acts of service and other missionary related activities in the San Diego area. So she's getting the best of both worlds. And I just really thought, cool. how awesome is that? So Taylor, you are a marvelous member. That was a really cool article. Yes, it was. And again, every time we get a ser- one of these service missionary stories, I just think they're so inspiring. Oh, they really are. <laughs> I just love the new opportunities yeah. that are out there. Yeah, and that they tailor service missions to the unique talents and abilities mm-hmm. that these kids have. Yeah, And totally. it just makes it a wonderful opportunity for everybody. Totally. Okay, should we share some favorite things? Let's share some favorite Just things. Just because we like to because share. Because we're going to run out of time. <laughs> For the fun of it. Okay, I have two, so I'll have to go fast. Okay, well, I have two, I too. We both have two. We just couldn't resist this month. We're going into the holidays. There's lots of I things know, and to I've share. got two holiday ones. Okay, so my first one is a movie show, movie. The Christmas Story Story. Have you heard about this? this I is, have. I have not watched it they, yet. Is it really good? They did like a, re- a sequel yeah. reboot to the original Christmas Story. You know, you'll shoot your, eye, shoot your eye out. It's on HBO Max. I had very low expectations, but we love that movie. Our family grew up I know, watching that movie. Did. Our dad loved that movie. Probably because it was set in the 40s when he was yes, a kid. <laughs> I think so. So we've always loved that movie. We watched it with my family and it was really cute. Oh, I'm going to have to go watch and it. And it's got a lot of the original characters. Yeah. Ralphie comes back yeah. home to his house mm-hmm. um, and he has kids. Aww. It was it was cute. It was better than I expected. Okay, good. Um, second thing that is my favorite thing this month. I got one of those as seen on TV battery daddies. Have you seen the battery daddy? No, I don't even know what the battery <laughs> daddy is. Sometimes Do I, I need a battery daddy? You need a battery daddy. Sometimes okay. I'm a sucker for the as seen t- on TV okay. stuff. They sell them on Amazon though. You don't have to buy them on TV. Okay. But does it – well, first of all, so what is it? it? Is and second, a, does it work? It's a caddy for your batteries. It's like a little carrying case. It looks like a tool case. Okay. And it has little holes for all the sizes of batteries that you could ever desire oh. to put in there. And I ordered it on a whim on like a Black Friday okay. special thing. Okay. It's amazing. So, I mean, my battery storage was lacking. That's all So I'll what say. were you doing with your battery storage prior to this? They were just in a, like a Tupperware thing in my laundry room. So were they all mixed together and you had to be like, I need another double A. Where's the double yeah, A's? Some were mixed together. Some were in boxes. Some were okay. half out. They were a disaster. Okay. Now they live nice and neatly in the battery daddy. So what do you have in there? You've got triple A's and double A's. We have those square ones. That oh, the nine go volts. in the garage doors. Yes. And you got to keep those around because inevitably. You do not want to lose one no. of those. I also have the size that goes in your car key clicker. 
Oh. Because that has happened to us before also oh. and become a major problem. So I keep those on hand now. Oh. And uh, I don't know what else I have. I have big flashlight ones. I have a little medium. I don't know. Dang. I have a lot of batteries. The battery daddy. And I'm going to have to check that Going out. into the holidays when you're going to be putting all those batteries oh, in the kids' exactly. toys. I'm telling you, you need a battery daddy. Okay. <laughs> Well, my two are holiday related. I am going to start, first of all, for those of you who are watching us on video, this is called Offbeat Butters, and it is their gingerbread cookie flavor. So these are the same people that do Clean Simple Eats, a protein powder. Yes. And I have not tried the Clean Simple Eats protein powder. I know I was over here the other day and you were making a shake Mm -hmm. using it. Yeah, it's good. And it's just because I really don't do that many protein mm-hmm. shakes, but I know you like it. So, and when I brought this over tonight, you were kind of surprised. You're like, oh, you like those, but those, those butters. And I said, yeah, do you? And then you whipped out like four of them you had in your cupboard. And I'm like, hello, I learned this from my husband. You didn't bother to tell me this sister. I forgot. <laughs> so I tried a couple of yours tonight, including a lemon one that was really good. But this gingerbread cookie is only available, I think at the holiday time. Now, I know you put yours in protein shakes. I actually put this on toast. I replaced my peanut butter with this gingerbread cookie on toast, and it is dang good. So I know they have a website where you can order them directly. For our Boise peeps who live here in the Valley, there is a place that just opened called Modern Barbecue Supply, and they have a whole wall full of the Clean Simple Eats protein as well as these butters. So if you want to go and pick them up directly, you can pick them up directly in Boise. (laughs) And so then my other one is a Sprite, a holiday flavored Sprite. This is Sprite Zero. It also comes with the sugar, but... I like the Sprite Zero, and it is a winter spiced cranberry, and this is a pretty rad drink. Okay, so this is different than regular cranberry, because I've had cranberry 7-Up and Sprite before. Is it spicy? It's it's not like super spicy, not like, um, remember when Diet Coke came out with those flavors, and there was one of those. The spicy one. Yeah, there's one of those that was really spicy. It is not nearly as spicy as that, Mm -hmm. but it has just a little, just a little, it's slightly different than the regular than the regular cranberry that they do. A little cinnamon. Um, Yeah, maybe just a little cinnamon, but it is delicious. You're going to have to leave that one here with me. I will leave this here with you because (laughs) Fred Meyer had a sale over Thanksgiving weekend and I bought four 12 packs because you had to buy four 12 packs to get the sale price. Oh, well then you're all set. So yes, I will leave this here with you and you can try it and see what you think. So those are my, those are my favorite things tonight. Yay. All right. Well, thanks for listening, everyone. Yes. Thanks, Twim Nation. Um, You can uh, find us on Facebook. You can find us on Instagram, on the Twitter. So be sure and reach out. I need to ask Kurt what the new email is because is it still contact? I mean, it's probably still contact at thisweekinmormons.com, but Jeff isn't answering the emails anymore. Kurt is. So feel free to email <laughs> Kurt. He'll love it. He'll love it. And Kurt will probably be back with a co-host next week. I'm sh- and hopefully he will be. And-, and we'll be back in December. Yes. Probably. Thank All you. Right. Thanks.